Good evening. On behalf of the Newark Public Library, welcome. I am Tom Ankner, the director of the Charles F. Cummings New Jersey Information Center at the library. Tonight, we have the pleasure of co-sponsoring another talk by the Newark History Society. The Society's presentation will explore the career of Cecil Dorian, uh, who covered the World War I for the Newark Evening News. Dorian was one of the few women correspondents covering that war. All cameras and microphones, other than the speakers and co-sponsors, will remain off during the presentation. If anyone has a question or comment, please type it in the chat box or Q&A box, and the speaker will get to as many as she can after her presentation. And now, to introduce the speaker, here is Natalie Borisovitz of Rutgers University, Newark, a board member of the Newark History Society. Natalie? Thanks, Tom. Um, good evening. As Tom said, I'm Natalie Borisovitz, a member of the board of the Newark History Society. And on our behalf, I'd like to welcome you to the first of the Society's spring programs. Um, I know most people don't think of January as spring, especially when, <clears throat> excuse me, there's snow coming down the pike. But uh, for those of us who divide the year into semesters, this is spring. Um, I do want to also uh, reiterate what Tom said about uh, putting your um, and, I, and I know most of us are Zoom qualified, probably we feel we're kind of overqualified at this point, um, but uh, that as you think of questions, do put them into the Q&A, um, you've got the button at the bottom of your screen or into the chat box, or you'll forget what they are. Um, so we want to make sure that we address those questions. Um, so I would bet that at least some of you were present at the um, a New Newark History Society uh, program uh, at NJPAC in September of 2017, when John Zinn gave us a wonderful presentation entitled Over There, Men and Women from Newark Serve on the Western Front. And many of us were particularly intrigued when he brought up Cecil Dorian, um, the foreign war correspondent for the Newark News during World War I. Um, I don't believe there was anyone there besides John who had ever heard of her before. And if they did, they certainly did not know that Cecil was a woman. Um, I'm a librarian and um, I spend most of my time looking things up. Um, so after the program, I immediately started looking for information on Dorian, and I was also being prodded by a number of people who emailed me who had been at the program and, you know, what else is there? What can we find about this woman? And um, there was really virtually nothing. And the only thing I substance that I could find was Carolyn Eady's um, dissertation, and then what was her very recent book at the time on the women war correspondent, the U.S. military and the press, 1846 to 1947. And I was even more excited a few years later to find out she was planning a book on Dorian. Uh, Carolyn Eady is an associate professor of journalism at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. Uh, where she was named the outstanding professor of 2015-2016. Um, she has an undergraduate degree from St. Lawrence University and an MA and PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, she's also just completed a book with military historian Chris Dubbs, which is due out early next year on the Saturday Evening Post war correspondence during World War I. Uh, before teaching, Carolyn worked as a journalist, writing from publications ranging from the Chapel Hill Herald to Newsweek to the Yoga Journal. Um, reviewers called her book on the woman war correspondence fascinating, thoroughly documented, well-researched, and enjoyable to read. That one, that's a biggie. <laughs> OK, uh, they also called it a significant contribution to both women's studies and the history of war correspondence in general, male as well as female. And a number of the reviewers also pointed out that it was notable not just for the content, not just those new ideas that Edie was bringing forth, but also for what they called the superb appendices which were full of new names to know and new leads to pursue. Uh, luckily for us, Cecil Dorian is one of those new names to know. Uh, so let's welcome Carolyn Eady, who will tell us a bit about what she's come to know so far. Take it away. 
Thank you very much, Natalie. And I should say that um, I actually came to Newark to look at Cecil, uh, or look up things about Cecil in about 2018, which is when I first, um, my, my first visit, I think, to Newark. Um, so I enjoyed that very much. So thank you all for having me. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my slides with you as I begin this. Um, okay, and let's see. <laughs> I need, well, I'm sorry, one quick second. So I always have this problem where once I start the slideshow, it doesn't let me, I can't see Zoom to see the slide. So one second, I apologize. Um, you have to click on the share screen and then there's a window that comes up and then you have to click on it again. Oh no, I got that. I just, I had shared, I started the slideshow and then I couldn't see Zoom once I did that, so. Oh, okay. Um, one second. There we go. Okay, and so are you seeing the slide or my whole? Yeah, we see it. We see them. My notes as well, or just the slide? We uh, we can see the notes too. You want to go up? I think. You okay. Want there to... you go. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Thank you. Okay, great. So, I first, um, I Natalie mentioned my dissertation when I was getting when I was um, researching. Um, I was researching Inez Robb actually before I started planning for my dissertation and I started becoming interested in women war correspondents because Inez Robb was someone I had never heard of and she claimed to have been the first woman attached to a military unit um, and she was attached to the WAX in um, 1940, um, 1944. So I started, I did, I naively thought, oh, I'll do my dissertation on women war correspondents in World War II, thinking that there really wasn't much before that. Um, and when I started searching for women war correspondents, that's when I found an obituary claiming that um, Cecil Dorian was the first woman war correspondent to reach the um, American front and to be accredited, which as I looked further into this, I, I found that even more interesting because um, you'll, as, and I will keep talking about that further, but um, many people have claimed to be the first as, as I'll get to. So anyway, I, as I became intrigued with Cecil Dorian, um, I had to keep putting it aside for her, all of her stories aside for the book that I was in the dissertation so that I could finish my degree and, be, and start teaching full time. So this woman here, Cecil Inslee Dorian has occupied some part of my brain, I think since 2008 at this point. And I keep being shifted away from her for other deadlines. As Natalie just mentioned, um, um, we just, I just completed a book with Chris Dubbs um, at his suggestion on World War I and Saturday Evening Post. But I will say that um, that has helped bring, give me a lot more context for um, what I'm about to talk to you about with Cecil Dorian. So this is a picture of Cecil Dorian here. Um, it came actually from an article um, that Tom sent me from his microfilm collection, probably in 2018. So thank you, Tom. Um, so Cecil was born in Troy, New York in 1882. She actually was baptized, she, um, she was baptized, or, or excuse me, she was christened Adelaide. And Adelaide is a name that she seemed to use alternately. Um, she seemed to use it up through maybe her sophomore year in college. Um, so you'd see in some of her census records and in some of her other records, she's sometimes Adelaide and sometimes Cecil. She lived in Woodridge, New Jersey, when her sister Alice died at age seven. Um, and I think this is an interesting point when I talk about the relationship she had with her mother later. Um, but her mother in one census document um, re reported that she had lost 10 children and had one living child. Um, so they were a family of three and the mother and daughter grew very close as I'll show you. Um, in 1889, Cecil, Cecil gave the salutatory address at her normal college training department. And then, excuse me, the year late, a year later, she applied um, to Barnard. So, to, I always say that wrong, I apologize. To um, Barnard, but I'm gonna say it wrong again, so I won't try again. So she was um, at Barnard um, from 1901 to 1905. And she had, she had the kind of activity that you might expect from a high school student trying to get into college rather than a woman attending a, college, attending a woman's college um, in 1901. She was, on, she was a member in, of the tennis club, the basketball club, the ping pong club, and, and baseball club. 
Um, and in fact, one baseball game, her team was called the Dorians and they won and she was the pitcher. <laughs> she was the team captain of basketball. She was um, about as active an individual um, in college as I have <laughs> come across. Um, she was a regular writer and editor for Bar the Barnard Bulletin, which is on news, um, was their kind of their campus newspaper. Um, she was the Glee Club president, first mandolin in the mandolin club. Uh, in her senior year, her class voted her, she was class president. She was voted most athletic and best all around girl. And I think this is interesting because one article I found about her later, maybe 20 years later after she had died, said that she was, it was, a, a, was kind of taking some claims um, for the, the origin of the field day for um, away from Cecil, Cecil and saying that she was a very unhappy girl. But I'm, I say that because I'm, as I'm getting into this research, when you're dealing with the past like this, as you all may imagine, you come across rumors, you come across misinformation all over the place. So I think, um, so as I'm trying to figure out who she is, I sometimes come across contradictory things, but the only thing I ever came across to suggest that she was unhappy was that one line that, I'll, um, that I mentioned. Um, so she started writing about theater for the New York Tribune as early as 1904. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about her writing, even in that very early article, um, when she was, you know, just um, probably 22, she would draw in as much context and precise detail as I've seen in, you know, as you can see in an in-depth piece. Um, and so... I, um, she and she seemed to take a wide variety of classes at Barnard, different languages. Um, she wrote about, um, sorry, she wrote plays starting in in college, and she later would tell one um, reporter that she wrote she had written hundreds of plays by 1916, but most of them ended up in the trash. Um, so this this picture here is from the mortarboard, which was the Barnard. Uh, yearbook and this is her senior year quote and this is a picture of Cecil just so much work as keeps the brain from rust just so much play as lets the heart expand and that really summed up from what you would perceive of her college years there so um and this um she is in the fourth row there I have not been able to find her but she's in there somewhere um and here so from from when she graduated college she um there were different bulletin notes saying that she was going to write a book or that she was working for Ladies Home Journal. And one said that she had um, was helping with the Century Dictionary. I haven't found anything to verify any of those uh, or to any other um, secondary sources for that. But she did write regular book reviews for the designer. And she became Oliver Morosco's European representative um, for theater. She would go and recruit plays for theater. And this, um, let me jump ahead for a second because this gets interesting, I think. She worked for Morosco for um, at least through 19, from about 1908 to 1915. And here you can see that she actually was given James Joyce's play and then she rejected it <laughs> shortly after. And but she, in Ezra Pound wrote, to James Joyce to say, Mr. Dorian, um, he mistook her for a man with her name. Um, Mr. Dorian has rejected your play. So she, um, she began writing for the New York Tribune, as I said, in 1904, when she started writing, critiquing plays, but she started, she, be, she continued to write regularly for them and became a drama critic and for a short time was their drama editor as well. And Beginning in 1908, she was doing so while abroad. So even at a young age, she was serving as a foreign correspondent, but her articles were about theater. She would do profile famous individuals. She would write about places as though they were characters. And again, her writing, um, I, as you know, I, as Natalie told you all, I teach journalism. And so I've been just really impressed with how, with a number of, um, detail, vivid details, and, and the narrative techniques that she used throughout her pieces. Um, 
and especially the way she would weave in his history, talk about economics, talk about public policy. You know, even when she was writing an article about a church, you know, or a, um, you know, when she was doing what might have been seen as feature, you know, feature soft news pieces that she would put so much work into her reporting. So I think this is interesting because we see this later when in her war correspondence as well. Now on the right here is her play, is a key sheet from her play, The Age of Reason. And that was a, one of the play she wrote, I think she, she has about five plays that she has under copyright. I have only been able to locate Age of Reason and one other that is in Brown University archives um, that have been closed to me and they will not, um, I have not had a chance to travel to, to, to Brown to visit those. And since the pandemic, they have been closed to, um, or last time I checked. So she did write several plays, uh, but The Age of Reason was the only one that I'm aware of that was produced on stage. And it was, had a pretty big following and was reviewed all over the country. Some reviews were good, some were bad, and it, it was about the children of divorce. And this was in 1916, okay? So um, here's just a quick look at the types of pieces that she was doing as early, this was from 1913. She was doing quite a lot of travel. So by the time the war started, she had done, she had written about Italy, Germany, France, England. And she was living in England in 1914 when the war started. And so, um, but she was working for, she was working for Morosco and working more as a theater critic at our, excuse, excuse me, as the representative of Morosco trying to recruit plays and, and find plays. But this piece here, so um, she, during that time, she had, she stopped writing for New York Tribune around 2013. One article in the editor and publisher says she, you know, severed I used the word severed, but I, it didn't say exactly why um, or did not say why. So she stopped writing for New York Tribune. She started writing all these letters to relatives. And one of them, this here, um, I don't know whether this article was sent to the new, this is the Newark call. If you look at the top of it, you can see um, the Newark call, November 15th, 1914. And so this article, ran in the new um, the New York call, but it was not unusual for reporters to be to work as specials, which was the term they used as a for a freelancer, a special correspondent. And many of those writers would send articles in the form of letters. So this this says here, this interesting letter from London, which follows, was written by Miss Cecil T. That was a mistake. It's I. Cecil Dorian, daughter of J.A. Dorian of the city. The latter is secretary to Dr. To Edward Weston of the Weston Electrical Instrument Company. Miss Dorian was formerly dramatic critic of the New York Tribune and is now representing, now European representative for all of Morosco, a leading American theatrical manager and producer. So this was one of, I think, two articles I found of hers in the New York call. Um, and it does, it does show you her other connection to Newark, which was that her father was the secretary to Edward Weston um, for, until he died until my, in 1915. Okay, so then she switches over, oh, I should back up and say that all of the scrapbook photos in here come from Hoover Institution. And either I or my daughter who was in school at Stanford at the time, um, this is the Hoover Institution on Stanford's campus, they have, um, scrapbooks and papers of Cecil Dorian's. And those were given to them by Junius Craven, um, who died in 1930, I believe 1936. And I have, I'm still also connecting that and that's another story. But these, that's what the, these, these scrapbook photos are from the Hoover Library. Okay, so this is the first um, Newark Evening News article that appears in Cecil's scrapbooks. She, her earlier ones are all with the with other publications. And in the Newark Evening News digital archive, which was it was very exciting for me to learn that they, they, they had available online these um, the years that, uh, that Cecil had worked for them. And so the search engine is um, 
you know, with any scans like this coming from microfilm, it's not a perfect search. So you have to do a lot of, um, you have to go through and um, look page by page. And so far I have only found that she wrote, um, I found other articles earlier in April, 1915, but I have not found evidence that she wrote for them before then. Um, but, as, but again, the digital archive just went online and I have not spent as, um, so there may well be earlier pieces as well. Okay, so here is, um, excuse me for a minute. This is a picture of right here. This is um, Cecil in her war correspondent uniform in 1918. And this picture here is Cecil's mother. And the reason I have a picture of her is that women at this time, if they were single, um, they especially, they did not, they traveled with a chaperone. So for instance, um, Cora Harris, who's in a book I was, uh, that I was working on with Chris Dubbs, uh, or that we just finished with Chris Dubbs, she, she hired a woman to travel with her. Um, Cecil traveled with her mother. And so, and her mother was with her in, on every trip, as far as I can see. And I've relied on passport records and passenger lists for this, as well as her own scrapbook. So this, on the back of this picture, which is, exists in the Hoover archives, the photo of Mrs. Dorian, it says, Mrs. Dorian infers. Uh, so um, many of the photos in the Hoover collection do not have captions. They have piles and piles of photos that um, it seems that Cecil took, and which is another interesting fact that I'll get to. And the photo right here, sorry, the photo at the right there is with the AEF um, American Expeditionary Forces Signal Corps. And that's a photo I took from the National Archives. Okay, um, it's part of a larger photo that you would have seen in the invitation. Okay, um, now, so let, getting back to misinformation about women war correspondents, this woman here on the left is Peggy Hull. And for, for years, if you ask anybody who studied journalism history, they would tell you that Peggy Hull was the first and only woman to be accredited to the US military as a war correspondent in World War I. In World War I, it was so difficult to become an official accredited war correspondent. Your paper would have to guarantee $10,000, which in today's dollars, let's see, I haven't done the math in a while, but in the, in, so about a, about $1,000, it's about, a, I would say it was probably about $100,000. Someone can check me on that, but it's quite a lot of money back then. Um, and so in the end, by the end of the war, only a little over 30 men, and they were all men, had actual official accredit accreditation in that sense of the term. Um, Peggy did manage to get that type of accreditation right after the war ended, <laughs> okay? But what is, when we think of accredited correspondence, there were actually a thousand of them who were visiting war correspondents, and they were also accredited, but at a different capacity. And Cecil and at least 18 other women were among that group, and they were there far sooner than Peggy Hull. And the reason I think this is so interesting um, is that one of the reasons we don't know who Cecil was, if you ask me, um, is she was not a self-promoting type, right? So in most of her, um, in fact, all of her articles bill her as a staff correspondent or a war correspondent. They do not bill her as a woman war correspondent or a female war correspondent until you get to articles that are talking about her. Peggy Hall's articles, her, her newspapers were using the novelty of her being a woman at the front in all of her papers. And so most of the women that we know about today um, are women who were promoting themselves in this way. They also tend to be women who lived longer. Cecil died when she was 43. Um, Peggy here, she was, um, she was, uh, she was, I'm not diminishing her reporting at all, but she was a very self-promoting, you know, she does what was one secret to her success. And here you see a uniform that she had made for herself, right? Um, so anyway, so you can't say that, uh, you know, it's, it's tempting to say, oh, Cecil's the first then, but actually there were a number of women who were reporting in different capacities throughout World, World War I. So it really depends on how you wanna define that. Um, a number of women went over with the Red Cross or they went over to the YMCA 
and they did that kind of reporting as well. But here you have, this, this is from 1919. These are papers that I um, photographed at the National Archives um, at College Park, Maryland. And this is um, written by Arthur Harzel and it's written in 1919 and it's an assessment of the war correspondence. And so it picks out this, he picks out these individuals as the full entire list of visiting war correspondents of longest service. And you'll see George Petullo is on there, um, Fraser Hunt. Um, so this is one of my points too, is that these may be names that you, Frank Sibley, that you understood to be war correspondents and accredited, but this was the type of accreditation they had. And it's the same type that you'll see at least two women had, um, on, at least Cecil Dorian and Elizabeth Fraser. And actually a previous list also had May Burkhead and somehow he took her off. So these were the visiting um, war correspondents of longest service. And then he did a little write up on each one. And here you will see that her name is spelled Cecile, um, but she never went by Cecile, it was Cecil. And as an aside, somehow that seemed to be a popular name for girls in Newark, at the, in New Jersey at that time. But anyway, she, um, here he writes, Miss Cecil Dorian so wrote more intelligently about the operations of the army than any other woman, cor woman correspondent if one judges her writings from a military viewpoint. Miss Dorian came over here last spring and visited the battlefields at various times. Her work is well known throughout the Eastern part of the United States. Miss Dorian is in Paris. So, and here's um, an example. Um, this is from January 1917. She did start writing about the war um, in 1914, and then she was taking Johns over to write more in 1915, but she really stepped into the role of the war correspondent um, when, when, Amer after, when America um, started entering the war and in 1918 especially. However, um, one of the things I found really interesting is that she covered she never had one single area that she would cover. When she was writing about England or France in 1914 and 1915, she was covering every aspect of the home front, the British home front, the French home front. And then she was also taking journeys over and writing about the war from different perspectives. But she says at one point that she tried her best um, in, um, to get to Reims in 1914 or, excuse me, 1915, and she said, but she, she tried to pretend that she was a um, editor for an architectural magazine so that she just needed to see a church, but that didn't help her get to the front after all. So, but she did get to the front in 1918, um, and the New York Evening News says that she was the first to reach the American front in 1918. And I hesitate to whenever I see first because every newspaper loved to tell you that their reporter was the first. It was a promotional thing on the behalf of the part of the newspaper. The other thing is at that time, you can think you're the first, but it doesn't mean you, you don't necessarily know who came before you. So um, she was definitely among the first because she was there um, right from the beginning at the French, the, Amer the American French front in France. Um, there were women reporting in trenches in 1914 though. Um, but obviously not for, um, but that was before America was in the front in the war. So um, here are, so let me go back a second. And Natalie, Tom, Beth, if, um, since I can't see anybody, if you need to stop me to um, ask questions or anything, I can't see the chat. So um, just unmic yourselves and let me know. Uh, so, we're going to wait until after your talk and then we'll ask the questions. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, so. Here you can get you can get a little bit of the sense of her writing here. It is an enviable moment for the civilian, the one in which he is handed the new, almost unobtainable permit to pass the barriers beyond which lies the area reserved for war. Perhaps no one enjoys the privilege so keenly as someone who has at another time penetrated through all the restrictions right up to the dividing line where sentries with presented arms will not allow another step forward and has looked across the forbidden country and listened to the faint sound of guns drifting from the somewhere beyond. So um, yeah, so this, she had been trying several times until she finally got there. But now here, um, I mentioned her photos and I think it's interesting too, how often I hear 
um, or we'll hear this woman, you know, in World War One or World World War Two, maybe was the first woman photojournalist. Well, in World War One, journalists were more um, similar, in some ways, more similar to journalists today, in that they would take their own pictures and they would take, you know, they didn't have the um, in World War One, they didn't necessarily have the person who was just a photographer. They would take their pictures and they would write. So Cecil sent a lot of pictures back to her newspaper. Um, and the picture on the bottom right here, that's actually Cecil, who is second from the left, I'm uh, second from the right, excuse me. Um, and she's, you'll see, it says at the bottom, near the front line, the party from left to right consists of an Argentine newspaper correspondent, um, M. Garnier, editor of the Libre Parole of Paris. And then it says the news correspondent. And that's Cecil right there. And I should say to back up, um, her most of her articles ran with the byline staff correspondent. And then at the bottom, it would say Cecil Dorian. Um, and then the articles would reference her as the correspondent. Um, so these are, so these, a lot of the photos that came through were actually from the Signal Corps or from other agencies, but many of them are headlined as being Cecil's own work. So I thought that was interesting as well. Um, so, uh, so she gets to the French front and she does some really, I, I think, incredible reporting. And then in October, she is on this tour of with the um, with the press department of the foreign office and, sh and she's with um, Eunice, I'm not sure if I'm saying her last name correctly, Tia Tien, and um, Elizabeth Shepley Sargent, and as well as Ma um, Mademoiselle de Vallette, who's heading the section. And Mademoiselle de Vallette reaches over to pick up what she thinks is might be an interesting souvenir for her nephew, and it's a and she she mentions that she's going to go grab this, and she picks it up, and it kills her. It goes off, and it kills her, and it um, critically injures um, two people: the um, sar the soldier who was with them, um, as well as, as Elizabeth Shepley Sargent. And um, Elizabeth Sargent wrote Shepley Sargent wrote um, Shadow Shapes and wrote about her. Um, recovery. And Eunice Tietjen also was injured in that, and she doesn't appear in this article, and I'm not sure why, but she was also a war correspondent at the time. Um, and you'll see the first announcement called Elizabeth Shepley Sergeant Elizabeth Shirley Thornton. And that's just a really interesting thing or important thing to keep in mind when you are researching newspapers is how often mistakes are made and then picked up nationally. So even in this piece here, you see Cecil is called Daria. <laughs> On the right here, um, Cecil Dorian has been acting as European correspondent for the New York Evening News for about a year and a half. Um, and then you'll see it mentions that she's the daughter of C.A. Dorian, which is actually Joseph Dorian, who was secretary to Dr. Edward Weston. Okay. Um, so here, um, another thing I just wanted to throw in because I know this is with the Newark connection, the New Jersey connection, um, and especially if you were attending John Zinn's talk um, over there. Here you see an example of her writing, but it is also um, about the 312th Regiment at Grand Pre. Um, and I apologize if my pronunciation of any of this, I'm used to reading all of these rather than saying them out loud. Um, and here you see one of the things I, I wanted to show you too is that when her work ran, it very often ran on the front page. And it very often ran with these, with this kind of preface in this box here that was written by um, the editors at the Newark Evening News. And again, I think that's one of the things that I found significant about that is that nowhere do they ever reference her as, hey, it's a woman writing at the front, which is really atypical for um, you know, most of the women who were writing, that was how it was billed. It was about, okay, here, here's a woman, she's going to give us the woman's angle. And here, um, Cecil wrote as much about military operations and foreign policy as anything else. Um, and here you see the editor say, for the first time, there is herewith presented a vivid account of the actual fighting experiences the notably heroic and highly successful achievements at most important strategic points on the French front of Newark's selective service soldiers, who, with companions from other 
<laughs> from other Essex communities and from Hudson County make up the 312th Regiment of the 78th Division of Pershing's Army. The story comes from the Evening News' staff correspondent in France who has been with the troops and so was able to get firsthand statements. There are, in addition, instances related of individual courage and initiative and of the almost indescribable hardships cheerfully undergone and surmounted not only by the men, but also it is set forth by a former East Orange teacher, a woman who has had a part in YMCA canteen work. Conspicuous instances of quickness and devotion to duty on the part of Newark men come in for due mention. The whole record has now disclosed being one to stimulate, to stimulate the pride, pride and prepare the way for further voracious stories of the epic goings over there. So Cecil did cover women as well. And she would write, she wrote about a lot about women's work and, but it was always in the context of here is information about the whole community, the whole world. It was never, and that's something else I found interesting about her writing and even just her life at um, Barnard is she really embraced every opportunity despite um, her time. And she seemed to have the same outlook in her reporting as well. So I thought that was interesting. Um, okay, and so here is just another example of the 78th division um, of, of her writing about covering local um, regiments in, in her reporting. And then another thing I wanted to show you with this one is that a lot of times her art, her work was picked up by other newspapers, not just in this case, this is a um, Corning New York paper, um, but they, it was also, her work was also picked up by international papers. I'll show you a couple examples. And um, yeah, so let's see. So this one here, here's an example. And you see here it's in French and um, it talks about how, um, I said I have the I might have the arrow in the wrong place now that I put this <laughs> miss yeah the arrow is a little below where it should be Miss Cecil Dorian writes on the subject of relations between the United States and the Swiss um, and so and this on the on the right here um, this is a, her passport photo so there's another photo of Cecil Dorian they're not that easy to find um, and that's from 1920 that photo there and then here um, this is an example her her work was picked up by the service record of 1919. And they talk about um, the Lightning Division. And so anybody who is interested, and I think there are a few, few, at least a few who are attending for the, because they are interested in her coverage of the 78th Division and some of the um, local coverage of World War I. Um, I should get as an aside, I'd be very happy to talk further with anybody even after my talk and share some of the materials that I have found. Um, and so I think, you know, this is just interesting. Her, um, I don't actually have a sense of, I wanna make sure I'm not, yeah, I wanna make sure I give enough time to everybody. So here's another example. And I realize it's probably all too small, but I just wanted to give you a taste for what the scrapbook was like in, um, in what her writing is like. And you see here too, how her byline says with the American armies, um, and you can kind of get a sense. Another last thing I wanted to say is that some of her, most of her pieces, try to remain objective and are in third person. She does slip into first person from time to time. And whenever she does, I find that very exciting because I get to learn more about her. Um, but that was actually pretty common at that time for journalists, especially in the war, to write in a narrative, giving their perspective on what they've seen and using first person. Okay, so um, jumping way ahead, um, after the war, um, she covered, um, a Newark Evening News editor once said that she had covered every, she'd attended every international conference. She continued to travel. Um, she covered, um, she traveled through Russia and Turkey and she continued to travel and write. And then in the um, f few years before her death, she stopped doing bylined work and started doing editorials for the Newark Evening News. And here's, um, you can see these were in her scrapbook. And so um, they did not have her, they have CID at the bottom rather than her name. Um, but even beyond that, she would write um, editorial, she should have, she would write editorials without, even without her name as well. 
Um, and then this is her death certificate that I requested from Maryland. Um, and I think another thing interesting, especially in terms of the pandemic, is that she did die of pneumonia um, and I think had been sick in, um, several times during her travels. And so I don't know, um, you know, I, I'm that's another, I have so many different kind of strings in terms of different directions to go in with um, each detail I find, I wanna go dig up more. So, um, but, and I visited her grave at the Evergreen Cemetery in Newark and that's there. So, so that's quite a lot <laughs> to, to um, leave, leave you all with, um, but I, would be very happy to let the rest of the conversation go by answering questions or moving okay. that direction. Okay, well, thank, thank you, Carolyn. That was really great. Um, now, like, like you said, let's get to some questions. Um, why don't we start with Natalie? Natalie, do you have some questions for Carolyn? Um, yeah, so, so Carolyn, um, 1914, she's in London. How does she become the staff correspondent for the, for, for the Newark News? I mean, is there any idea? I mean, did she approach them? Well, did that's they... something that has been, you know, I've waste, I've spent, I shouldn't say wasted. I've spent so much time going, looking for the needles in the haystack and I haven't given up. I still have, you know, I have a lot of collections like, like to visit um, that I keep, you know, I look at all her different contacts and try to find those. Um, but I will say she was she wrote so prolifically for the New York Herald Tribune for the New York Tribune and and for travel and all of these magazines um, that she was more than qualified and so they might have even approached her but I don't know um, she was working for the Morocco company and that was her official job but she continued to write and report um, and as I said I I um, I don't think that she wrote, I've seen in places saying that she wrote for them as early as 1914, but I haven't found any evidence, but I did just learn that I can access, um, Tom told me the, the digital archives that were put online about six months ago. So um, I hadn't, you know, this is when, when you, every time you don't look, then there's new things. <laughs> so, um, but I have been looking for um, the employee records for, I bothered, in fact, I've bugged both of you several times to ask, but so far I think, the employee record started like 1942, correct? In, in, in Newark? Well, that was the last you told me, Tom. I'm get, taking that from an email that you sent me. I like, seem to remember years. that, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I haven't, and I've looked up Scudder, I've looked up all the names and I have not found, I haven't been able to trace that yet. But it all, again, she was overqualified for it. And I will say, um, you know, when I listened to John Zinn's talk and he talked about how there was one other, I thought, I think he mentioned that she was the only war correspondent who had bylines. Um, and I haven't gone through as many, I'm sure as, as, as he has to look at that. I've, you know, I've been through her scrapbook, but not through the original newspapers as quite to that extent. But W. Um, F. Collins, William F. Collins was a war correspondent for Newark Evening News. And there is at least one other who may or not, may be W. F. Collins who worked for Newark, um, but mostly they used associated press stories. And so you'll often see like when there's huge news, associated press, you know, they could cable, you know, and, and sometimes they would pay to have Cecil Dorian's work cabled over. But, but in, any, in any case, she definitely was filling a need, seems to have been filling a need for the paper. We have a couple of questions mm -hmm. in the chat. Um, now one person is asking, uh, Larry Green is asking, did she comment? on the status of women in the predominantly male profession of journalism and the impact of World War I on European women. On the impact of World War I? Oh, on uh, did she comment on the status of women in the predominantly male profession of journalism and the impact of World War I on European women? So two things. Did she okay. comment on one of it's those? It's just that last word that keeps getting- uh, Women, I, I think it's women. Women, or world. women. Okay, women, yeah. Women. Um, I have never studied how it, how her, her work, I can't speak to how it affected European women, <laughs> but um, I, I did mention my, you know, my book, which I will, you know, it's, it's right here. Um, women were, I looked at how um, women made their way into the field and it's an, you know, I don't, um, it's, what I'm struggling with is I have, you know, pages and pages to answer that question with. So to be, to give you a quick answer is a little tricky. Um, 
but I, what I think happened in, 19, in World War I is there were a lot of women who were, who were exceptional reporters and writers. They had all of these connections. They had um, the education at a time when very, you know, that was, you, that made you elite anyway to have a college education. So in World War I, um, you don't see it quite so distinctly, but what I found was that in World War II, you had women like Cecil um, or, you know, women, women that you might know of more, more be more likely to know of, Martha Gellhorn, Helen Kirkpatrick. You had these women, uh, Sigurd Schultz, who were writing um, because who, papers were hiring because they had every language set, they knew military, they were so good at this. And then in 1944, as part of this promotional kick the, um, for Total War, they started hiring women who had written only for women's pages and saying, okay, you're gonna be a woman war correspondent because we want you to come over here and help promote that women are safe here and, and talk about the care and feeding of the troops and stuff. And so in World War I, you do see some women taking on that role, but you also see it's not, it's not um, anything happening in an organized way so much. Although you have editors who are looking to um, reach more women uh, members of their audience because you have the, all the advertising and you have, you know, trying to, so that is another thing that happens. Um, I'm sure that I only answered a fraction of your question, but that question is actually pretty broad, <laughs> pretty broad, so. Yeah, well, in the, in the article about visiting the front at Rhymes, uh, she speaks of herself as a civilian using the pronoun he. Did she ever reveal her gender in her dispatches? Well, I think, first of all, I should explain, and I don't know who, how, what the age of that person is who's asking that question, but even when I was a child, um, I maybe I shouldn't say even at this point, but when I was a child, books, and, you know, I'm old enough to know, to remember when he meant he or she in everything, and I, when I read to my daughter, I, she was very confused by that, my daughter is 24 now, um, so it's been quite a while, but you'll notice on, if you look at government documents back then, if you look at anything, it will say he, and then it will say Mr. or Mrs., right? He was used throughout. So um, what I think is interesting is it might be easy to say, oh, people just assume she was a man. That's why she got all this coverage. And you will see instances where they say, oh, it was Mr. Dorian. But in fact, you'll also see Miss because it was a more formal time. And in fact, that's one thing when I was researching women war correspondents that made it difficult because women were also often just referred to as Mrs., you know, wife of with the male man's last name. But because Cecil was single, you find Miss everywhere. Um, but there'd be no reason for her to say, it was typical that they would call her he, and that was not done to disguise her gender, if that makes sense. Okay. Is there any record of what kind of camera or cameras she used? I uh, haven't found any yet. And, and, and sadly, her scrapbooks, um, her papers just consist of her scrapbooks. When I finally got into them, I was hoping for a lot more, you know, in terms of that. And again, um, Newark, that's something I have not looked into in Newark evening news from what I've seen, the files don't go back that far, but I could certainly look to see, you know, what cameras were the Kirtlands using in Leslie's Weekly in World War I or something, but I just, I don't know that. Okay. Do you know why she rejected James Joyce's play? No, um, I don't. <laughs> she, I, and I have the letter so I can send it, but I haven't um, looked at it recently. But um, yeah, so that just goes to show <laughs> rejection is. Yeah. I'm, I'm just reading these from the chat box now. That's Did fine. you report on the 1918 pandemic? Well, and that's something I, again, that I haven't studied enough and that I'd, you know, as I've gone through this, there's so many questions I still have. And, and I said that to Natalie at the beginning, like I, I'm, I'm coming through excited to share what I have found. Um, as I've looked through just looking for her work and not looking for things about the pandemic, I've just noticed and was saying to my husband the other day, you, you see like buried on like page three or something, like all these deaths from the flu and, and things like this. And so I've been sort of astounded by how little that I've seen about it. But again, that is just like, you know, my student or somebody saying, well, that's never on the news. And then it's always on the news. You just haven't seen it. So I, that's something I, um, yeah, I don't, I wish I had a better answer for, um, but it definitely doesn't seem to be something that she wrote about or concerned herself with. 
Was her death actually the results of the tail end of the pandemic? Well, that's what I was wondering. And I can't say, but it seems like that's possible. You know, but at the same time, I saw, you know, a lot of women or, you know, a lot of war correspondents after war, the trauma of war getting sick and dying after World War II as well. So I don't know. Um, yeah. When she returned to the U.S., does, do census or, does census information or other information show that she lived with anyone or alone? Um, every census document I have found, she lives either with her parents or with her mother. She does not seem to have spent any significant amount of time in the United States after 1907, maybe. So she, her father kept an apartment and worked for Weston and he would visit there are you know I've I've had somebody um, I've heard people speculate that they were estranged maybe also because of Cecil Dorian's play on divorce um, and again that's what I was saying is I try I'm trying not to make those leaps leaps but um, her there were there are passenger lists showing him going over abroad and coming back and there are some postcards that she sent to her parents in the scrapbook and she, uh, she calls them use, Y-O-U-S-E, which I thought was kind of funny for 1915 or so, but, or 14. Use, yeah. But um, I have found some of her, you know, I, again, I keep looking for her acquaintances and friendships and stuff. And so when I have come across names of her friends, I've been trying to harass, not really, but <laughs> trying to bug family members and say, do you have letters for this person and all that? So, um, and I've been doing a lot through Ancestry to try to find that letters that way too. But I have not really come upon many yet. So Cecil's headstone looks new. Um, I noticed that too. Uh, did she have a following or family members who kept up her grave over the last 100 years? I don't know. And I didn't, you know what though, on the ancestry just this week, I came and I made a contact with somebody who is a family member of the Dorians. Um, and I might share this talk with her as well. And so she might be able to answer that better. Although and I didn't notice that it looked, it might also be the photograph is what I'm saying. Oh, so, okay. But I, because I had, I, I do have the records from the cemetery for her and they do not show anything. They show her mother purchasing this for her. So yeah, so that actually answers your question right there, I think. <laughs> okay. okay. What made her a good war, a good correspondent? How did she construct her stories? Well, as I said, I, I think one of the things that I appreciate so much about her writing is that she's always looking at the big picture. So she w she'll be, and, and she's always looking at the small picture, you know? So the, it's kind of the ideal of writing is that she's very precise. She doesn't say large, she says 2000. You know, she's, she has the, you know, she quantifies things. She, she gives um, precise detail. But then she's also bringing in economic context and historical and cultural and religious context. And so uh, that's something that I found fascinating is that in some of her works, she has the ability to put you right in the scene, but she also has the ability to then get, tell you what all that means. Um, and so she's more interpretive. And, and I say this after having read, read so much World War I correspondent from the Saturday Evening Post and other places, um, which also was excellent writing, but I did find that hers was different in that way. Okay. Any idea of how or why she chose the name Cecil? No, and I wish I did. And as I said, you know, I, that's I, these are all these like, you know, I go down. I don't, her, um, I get confused about the Adelaide versus Cecil, you know, because I went to um, Barnard to see, well, is there someone else named Adelaide there? And there wasn't, Cecil was Adelaide. Somehow she called herself that. Now kids like to change their names, so I thought that's all, was, all it was, but one census document lists her as Adelaide. And as I said, her christening certificate, um, the record says Adelaide. So it, it was her mother's middle name though, right? So it might be a family name. Um, actually, I don't know that it's her mother's middle name. It's listed been, that way in a lot of things, yeah. Yeah, well, I've been looking It's Marie at, Cecil. Well, that, so yeah, I've seen it that way. I've also seen it, um, other ways and I've, her last name, anyway, I've been going down a rabbit hole with all of that. So I'll show you, I did see her middle name listed that way in one place, um, but I didn't know if that was correct because I've seen her mother's name written many different ways. So um, yeah, that might be where it came from, but then I don't know where Adelaide came from. 
except it does seem to be a name on the tree. And I, I don't know where Inslee came from either, actually. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so you mentioned in your talk that she traveled with her mother when she was in Europe. Um, did she have an especially close relationship with her mother? Do you know? I would think so, just from all the pictures and everything that I've seen. Um, yes. And, and that, and as I said, I think that may have been related to the deaths of her siblings as well, you know? And so, but they seemed to, they tra traveled everywhere together and in letters, um, in a few of the letters that I have managed to find, she talks about like her mother having to sit in the car and she feels bad because she, they got to go into Versailles and they only had like two tickets and they're going in and out, you know? So she references her mother as though she's a friend and companion. In, in, in instances. So I do believe they had a close relationship. And they are buried together separate from Joseph Dorian. Oh, okay. But her, but in the, anyway, I don't know what that means though either. So, because her, they have other family members who are buried at a third cemetery. So I don't know. Where are the letters to Morosco? I don't know. I haven't, I, you know, I've used WorldCat and Archive Grid to find those. Oh, the one that I had, that one letter yeah, that I that had, that was in, I believe, the Edward Mandel House papers at Yale. Hmm. Okay. Um, Ezra Pound, um, there are also in a collection of, um, the, there's also a rejection letter in a collection of letters between Joyce and Ezra Pound. That's a published collection. Have you come across letters to the editor about her reports? No, but I have not gone through, you know, the way that I would need to do that is to go through and look at every issue. You know, there isn't a way to search that. And so um, when I've gone through issues, I try to look for that and I've tried searches, but I, I haven't found that yet, no. Mm -hmm. Other than um, um, letter, a letter that was written to the Newark Evening News after she died from, and it was signed a colleague and it was raving about her work. So we had a discussion about the 1918 pandemic before. Um, uh, Dan O'Flaherty points out in the chat box that mortality was elevated for a decade after the 1918 pandemic, and that would encompass the year that she died. She died in 26, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. She was, at a, she was um, staying at a sanatorium in Maryland for a few months before she died, I believe, or mm -hmm. at least a month before she died. died. Do you think the scrapbook was kept by her mother? Um, I do. And I, the other thing is, is that she, her mother was originally from California and was engaged in a lawsuit from like 19, starting in about 1915 to try to get back some land that she believed owned to her father that her father had ceded to San Francisco. And so that connection and then um, with California and then Junius Cravens, I think may have worked, but I'm still tracking that down with Cecil Doran years ago, but he was an art critic living in California. And the only information I've been able to get about the origin of the scrapbook was that Junius Cravens donated it to Stanford. And he is an interesting story in himself, in, in, in his own right, because he fell off a cliff to his death. And for, at the beginning was it ruled a murder. And then the coroner, everybody just flipped it and said, no, it wasn't actually, it should have just been a fall. <laughs> so I have, I, I, that's, you know, there's all these interesting storylines to this, but he was an art critic um, in San Francisco. And so I was thinking maybe that's how, when she was there with the lawsuit, but I don't know. She lived as a boarder in New Jersey in her final years when, and died in, a, in the um, mid thirties, Marie Dorian did. Do you know what faith tradition she followed? No, um, I, unless if you look at funerals, um, I don't see, I think her father's funeral was in a Catholic church, um, but I didn't, it doesn't seem like they were, um, the religion was, at least it's not something in, in much of her writings. I haven't found much evidence of that. What was her undergraduate degree in? Um, at that time, I think that's a good question. I need, I, I would need to go look at that, look that up again. Um, but I also think it was a bit different then so that there, there were, when she went to Barnard and I, 
I could be, you know, when I take, when I teach journalism and I teach my students, I tell them, you know, just because I say something doesn't make it true. So you have to go look it up. So my memory of it is, I think, um, you know, that, that Barnard was an offering, you know, there were only certain classes that women were allowed to take through Columbia. They were entering through Columbia, but they were at Barnard. And um, I know that she took English and German and Latin and, and French, um, but I don't remember what her major was, but, and I know that she was writing plays throughout and had some of the, had many of them performed at the school, but she seemed to be all over the place doing just about everything, <laughs> so. How much guidance on her war stories did she get from her editors in Newark? My guess is none. I mean, and I say that not with any knowledge of hers, but um, after working on this book with Chris Dubbs and watching and seeing, well, I guess for a few reasons, seeing how it goes, you know, mostly work would be, they would type it out, it would go through the censor, and then it would take 10 days to reach an editor, um, or it was sent by cable, but there was no time or way to really communicate back and forth, you know, um, it, quickly. And so the other thing is, is that the other thing I did find was in the National Archives, I found all of her stories that pass censors. So I've also been able to look at the story that she submitted to censors and then see it and compare it with the story that appeared in the New York Evening News. And largely they're the same. So I don't think her editors, you know, versus that's a good question because very often the editors take a very heavy hand, but not in these situations. Okay. Um, someone in the chat box pointed out that she thought she saw her, um, Dorian's mother's maiden name as Cecil on her death certificate. Oh, no, that's, um, oh, that is where it says the, it's her, the maiden name is actually Keenan, but that's, but that's a good point. See, again, some of these files I haven't looked at in years. I have 3000 files on her in my, and I'm, you know, I have, and um, yeah, so because I have so many articles and um, documents from National Archives, but so there's two names on he, on the death certificate that um, Margaret Schuyler was her, one of her friends. And that's one person I've been trying to find and I contacted their family. Um, it does say um, Cecil as her middle name there. So, but it, her last name was Keenan. Um, but, you know, the other thing is, is that people were not as, um, afraid of government documents back then. As in my work at looking at women war correspondents, their names and change all the time. And, you know, they just, they lie on government documents too. So I'm not saying that this is that way, but I have seen, there were some of her documents that weren't as consistent and her age never changed. But in other women war correspondents I've looked at, their age goes down like five years every census. <laughs> You know, and, and so and so and some of them, you know, if they've been married three times, they don't want their name on there. Um, there were some interesting things I found out about the Keenan family. Um, and so that I think kept Marie from putting Keenan on there for a little while. So okay. this is more information that I'm sure <laughs> you need. But well, those are the questions that we have in the chat box. Natalie, do you have any other questions that you want to ask? Uh Oh, probably a million, but you know, they're all going to yeah. come to me later. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> okay. this has all been really fascinating. And, you know, she's a fascinating person, really. Is. Absolutely. This is, yeah, this is an, this is an interesting talk. Yeah, thank you, Carolyn. This was a great presentation. Well, I would, if you don't mind, I'd also like to say that um, I, one, I was very excited to give this talk, but also I've been trying to find more sources and learn more about Newark and her history. Um, and so if anybody does have leads or information or wants to follow up and talk to me about this, I would be grateful. And I'll put um, my email address in the chat. And so, and I'd be happy to hear from anybody. So. Any idea about when the book is gonna come out? Well, so um, I think at the point, this point, it's scheduled for early 2023. No, I, the Dorian, I think he means. Oh, the Dorian. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> actually, I'm starting with an article. Um, the, you know, I, when I talked to, I was, yeah, there's a longer story there. But at the moment, I'm working on um, an article about Cecil to start with. And then, you know, as I dig up, dig through everything. So, so I am working on an article that will be, um, that should be out later this year, but no, not the book yet, so. Okay, all right. So Natalie? Uh, so thank you all uh, 
you know, thank you, Carolyn, for, for this really uh, wonderful talk. And uh, you've presented us with an awful lot of information about a very fascinating person. Um, and uh, thank everybody who, who attended tonight. And, you know, if you've got more questions, uh, I'm sure Carolyn will be happy to hear from you. Um, I did want to, uh, I did want to mention the um, programs that the other programs that the Newark History Society will be holding uh, this spring. Um, so on March 7th, George Robb is going to talk about African American business women in early 20th century Newark. And then on April 14th, uh, Neil Mayer is going to talk about um, the rise and fall of the Newark beer industry uh, from an environmental perspective. Beer is always good. I know everyone gets excited about that. Um, but right now, both of those are scheduled to be at NJ NJPAC, but you know, we're just going with the flow here. So we'll see what happens. But um, I hope we'll see uh, many of you at, at these programs coming up. And thank you all very much for being here tonight. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for having mm -hmm. me. Good night. Good night. Good night.